Okay, today's theme is find your voice within the European narrative tradition. Welcome to True Stories 2018. We're going to have a very lovely day today. By the way, Jennifer's podcast for people who doesn't who don't listen yet, it's in Dutch. It's amazing. It's called Opgejaagd. Find it somewhere. First, on stage. A young man from Poland with the first book that's going to be published in Dutch, I believe, in just a few days' time. Is that true? Has just been released. Um, he may or may not be talking about that book to just now. I'm, I'm stalling because there is someone coming from the airplane who's supposed to be on stage after him. If she's not showing up in time, he'll continue to talk about that book, which I really hope will happen because it's about a Dutch sperm donor with no less than 200 children. It's a fascinating story and I'm really jealous that he had it first before we could do anything with it on a radio doc documentary. So here to talk about the Polish school of reportage and how the typical Polish style of storytelling inspired him in his own writing, Kamil Bauk. Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm... I think I'm gonna uh, talk about my my book as well, and just in a, a smaller uh, hall, uh, if everything will be on time. But for now, I want to tell you something about uh, tigers and circus, and what uh, living under communistic regime has to do with uh, tigers and circus. What those two things have in common. So I want to tell you about uh, how we Poles write reportages, so narrative, uh, non-fiction, non-fiction. And um, it all starts with, um, uh, I'm sure you know Kapuscinski. Raise your hand if you know him. Okay, I'm not going to talk a lot about Kapuscinski because uh, I like to be teasing and not to mention uh, like the, the, the biggest example. But first of all, the, my favorite definition of, of this genre is uh, a tale on what happened for real. And this tale should also give you uh, food for thought. Uh, but the word tale is very important because... That's a story. So storytelling is, is 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 one of the you know most important qualities in that. So what was the driving force for growth and creation of this uh, narrative genre in Poland? That was the communism. And uh, the thing is that during the communism, a uh, printed word was used to hide the truth. So that's at least what my older colleagues, that, that's what they said, because I, was, I wasn't born in communism and I was actually born in West Germany and then we moved after the communism to Poland, but I believe them. Um, so let's go back to uh, censor, censorship uh, and communistic censorship. It's like, uh, so if the printed uh, word was used to hide the truth, then the role of journalist was to uh, share some of his, of hers honest insights or uh, opinions uh, about something in elaborate way. So, you know, there were no obvious ways to uh, outwit the censorship. You had to really care for the story and, uh, uh, there were some, there were some uh, methods of uh, how to outwit the censorship. So actually, that's how the career of Richard Kapuscinski started. It was 1955. He was just 23 years old and um, just a journalistic beginner. And one of her, his first articles was about Nova Huta, so uh, the new steel mill in Krakow. That was a district in Krakow. And... Um, mm, his task was to bring some evidence for public that it's not such a bad place as other journalists uh, described. Uh, because as you may know, in communism there were no bad places at all. Uh, so that was the idea behind it. What Kapuscinski uh, wrote instead was a rather grim picture of this mill district with uh, poor people, poor organization of work, and 14 years old girls worked as prostitutes. Uh, and they did publish it. And after this publication um, of this first serious article by Kapuscinski, the editor of his magazine got fired. The censor who let this article be published got fired. Then unexpectedly, the manager of this new steel mill also got fired. And <laughs> guess what? Did they fire Kapuscinski? No. <laughs> Instead of firing him, they 
kind of promoted him because uh, they decided to send him to India for his uh, first uh, long travel. And it was extremely funny because at that time for Polish people it was, in, you know, it was far away to travel to Czechoslovakia or Germany. So India was quite a something. But uh, the funny thing about it was that Kapuściński at that time didn't speak a single word in English. So uh, he was alone in India, 23 years old. And what he did was uh, he bought the book For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway, and he started to learn English just out of this book. No wonder why he was so interested in wars after, uh, afterwards, because, uh, you know, those words just, just stick to him. So um, there were a lot of different censors in uh, working under the regime. Some, some were slow-witted, so it was quite easy to play with them. And some were just smart and clever, but very opportunistic. So they could possibly want to help those journalists, uh, but their job was not to help them. But as, 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 as with everything in communists, uh, the, the task of journalists was then to convince the censor that it's safe for him to confirm the publication and to publish the article. So this process, this play between censorship and uh, journalists in Poland, uh, gave uh, rise to a big literary game in Polish journalism. So journalists worked on details, metaphors and structures instead of telling the story straightforward. So, for example, one of my idols, idols Hanna Kras, is also translated to English and Dutch, not this book, unfortunately. Uh, she couldn't mention straightforward that there are problems with travels between cities in USSR because, as you may know, in USSR everything worked just, worked just fine because it was a perfect country. So, instead of that, uh, she wrote that the bus leaves every day except for the days when it rains, when there are snow drifts on the road, in case of spring mud, autumn mud, or in cases of, of holes and bumps on the road, usually caused by rain, by snow drifts, <laughs> or by mud. And it was possible to write it. Uh, she also interviewed some people in USSR, and, and there was the situation when the, there was one child, a very good pupil from Odessa. Um, so the government asked this boy to uh, officially cut the red ribbon at the opening of uh, one of the new buildings. And um, his mother told Hanna Kral that uh, she's not sure if it's going to work, because that there, there's not enough red material for ribbons in Syria at that time, so there are no ribbons left. Uh, then suddenly she realized that she's talking to a foreign journalist, so she has to be careful. So instead of that, she said that uh, there's no, not enough red ribbons in Odessa because there's so many new buildings being opened at the, at the moment. Kral uh, did use both of those quotations, and it worked as a perfect metaphor of communism. So instead of writing about the system, Polish reporters wrote about individual people's lives. Instead of being general, they would rather be specific, so not to show the whole mirror, let's say, but rather a piece of this mirror, which still reflects something, and rather a little drop of water than the whole ocean. Uh, this attention to detail metaphor and structure is like a secret power also now, also after, uh, after the communism. But one uh, more uh, additional example from the from times of communism uh, about tigers so there was a, there was a great reportage about so like narrative non-fiction story about uh, tigers and under the communistic regime it, not available in english unfortunately uh, but Barbara Wopinska did interview trainers of, of of tigers in circus in ussr and uh, she used all the quotes she found uh, relevant to build a metaphor of communistic system. So, so the trainings of tigers were situated in a central cage in this circus. The fireman working there uh, was, that was a joke, but they called him a secret security service. Um, they told uh, Barbara Wopinska that they, they, they have to get to know the nature of those tigers. So some of them were lazy, some of them needed to be bribed, and some of them had to stay in a cage because they couldn't really uh, life, uh, live outside of the cage. And they were also sensitive to uh, costumes and jewelry, so trainers didn't really wear those. Um, and of course, the best conditions for such uh, circus uh, trainers were in USSR, because there's circus there's a circus everywhere in USSR, as they said, which was extremely funny in Polish, because when 
we want to say that something is funny, we say, what a circus. So the circus everywhere in USSR was also kind of ironic. And at the end of this um, story, both the trainer and the director of the circus, they, they said that they really want everybody to love this circus. So that was also one of my favorite stories. So if you, if you think about the Imperial by Richard Kapuściński, you, you have like all of it, the details, metaphors, uh, also um, the language, uh, especially in Polish, it worked very well. He really wanted to show like the very old system that it's, it's gonna crash soon. So he used uh, language from like old Polish uh, books. Uh, not sure if it's visible in, uh, in English, but what's for sure visible is this attention to detail and to describe by this detail something uh, broader. And coming back to Hanaka, after uh, 1989, it was finally possible to write everything you want. Uh, there was even one reporter, narrative journalist from the communistic times, who decided to stop doing it because after the communism, everything was happening so fast that he said, such slow genre, um, you know, slow journalism, couldn't keep up with describing the re change in reality. But I really think he was wrong. Uh, in fast reality, we really need this reflection and consideration. And um, Hannah Kral showed, um, uh, showed it a few times. Now, now um, this fragment uh, uh, shows the, the big attention to details uh, in, in her book. Uh, so she's describing the story of a Jewish lady uh, whom a uh, husband had, had been sent to Auschwitz. And, um, uh, she described it by uh, telling the story of, of what kind of items she uh, sent to Auschwitz, uh, she believed so, uh, for, his, for her men. Mm, and then there's this um, little uh, scene uh, when uh, she met a guy and uh, he lifts her skirt and strokes her thigh. He's moved by the side of the run in her stocking and promises new ones, real silk. And she says, just give, me, just give me money, I'll do whatever you want, but I need lots of money. You see, my husband is in Auschwitz. He takes his hand away. Auschwitz, he repeats in a sad voice, he's lost all interest in her stockings and thighs. That's, that's like a combination of, of something very detailed with like a big historical event. Uh, that's something we also use a lot. And that's what my, my idols use. There is another uh, very interesting author uh, in uh, Poland, Mariusz Stygio. He wrote a book uh, about um, former Czechoslovakia called Gotland, also available in uh, like a lot of languages. I think uh, it's going to be published in, in Dutch this year. Um, so she, he told the story of, uh, of people from Czechoslovakia, for example, of um, Czechoslovakian actress Lida Barova, uh, who said that the only, uh, like in 1995 when, when, when she was almost, uh, uh, when she was very old, and she said that the only thing sh she's looking forward is, uh, to is uh, death. And, and then how he creates the story, it really moves me because then he is describing how uh, the urn was placed, like by, of Barova was placed in the family grave, uh, how uh, the urn was placed next to the urns of uh, her father, mother, and sister. How she was involved in all those deaths, not the, de the death of, of her father because he died of cancer, but that's like a narrative twist. And then you kind of know that that was a story about an actress, but, uh, but then it's suddenly it's a story about death, but you still don't know why. And, and then if you follow the story further, um, Mario Stigio uh, writes about uh, the change of name of Lida Barova. So she, she was called Ludmila Babkova and then uh, she changed uh, her name because her old first name didn't suit her new surname. And then he, he would introduce that in those days in neighboring Germany, a man was gaining absolute power who was also most grateful to his father for dropping the common rustic surname Schickelgruber because the greeting Heil Schickelgruber would have been to Lenny. That's how we introduce Adolf Hitler to this story. And then we know that something is, is, is going to happen. And actually, Lida Barova was a, 
uh, was in a romantic relationship with Joseph Goebbels. So that's 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 the tension he's, he's building here. Uh, another story in Gotland uh, is a story about American uh, student who arrives in Prague in Czech Republic, and um, she writes about Franz Kafka. Uh, so. She's asking around Prague if anyone uh, have ever read Kafka, but people don't don't really answer, uh, and they ask for document proving to that that, that that she has the right to ask that sort of question. Then um, that's how the story begins, uh, and then uh, she learned that there's a word Kafkarna, but she couldn't really tell what the word what does the word mean. So uh, the interpreter would always ignore the word. Uh, finally, she asked the question, what's Kafkarna? And she's like, oh, nothing. Uh, so you have words that can be used, she asked the interpreter. Uh, and the interpreter says that we don't have any forbidden words. Of course not. It's just that the word doesn't appear anywhere. But people keep saying it, he, she insisted. She insists. Yet, yet if you were to look for it in writing, you wouldn't find it. Because in our country, anything that isn't written doesn't really exist. And I will tell you frankly, that suits everyone fine. <laughs> uh, but the, by the end of the story, uh, there's, there's another twist that, that, that this story is actually uh, made up. So that's a, there's a story from a book, uh, and, and, and there was a Czech, Czechoslovakian Czech writer who wrote the story. But Mariusz Czigo started it as if it was uh, just a... Uh, non-fictional story, but it is actually because he's referring the story and in the middle he's changing perspective and, and, and saying that's not a real story, that's the content of the book of one writer. And then he keeps on going uh, in the story about this writer. So it's also, I would really recommend you to, to read this book. And um, next one. Uh, Witold Szabłowski, a bit younger reporter. Um, he has uh, just published in English, uh, and I think it's coming up in Dutch in a few months, um, his uh, great book about da dancing bears. So uh, the story of dancing bears was, uh, was also, it, it works uh, as a great metaphor for communism because, uh, you know, after the communism, everybody became free, not just Poles, Serbs, or Hungarians also Ukrainians, Bulgarians, Kazakhs. So big part of the world um, gained freedom suddenly, but people di didn't even know how to handle this freedom, if they want this freedom or not. So talking to Bulgarian journalist in Warsaw, Shabowski figured out that uh, there is this story of dancing birds in Bulgaria. So animals who had been trained to dance uh, for years in Bulgaria and who had been treated very cruelly. They were treated, on, on the one hand, as, as members of family, but on the other hand, they, so they were living with their owners, but on the other hand, uh, they told them to dance by beating them when they were very small. They would knock off their teeth and make them drunk alcohol just to make sure that they won't forget that their owners are stronger than them. So uh, they performed tricks for tourists, dancing, giving massages, um, and it all ended in uh, 2007, when Bulgaria, uh, after joining EU, uh, claimed that on June 14, 2007, the Bulgarian custom of dancing birds came to an end. Which is, uh, for, especially for Polish people, it's, it's a str strong wording because it sounds almost the same as the, uh, the, like the, the, the final sentence uh, at the end of the communism on our um, TV night show. So, uh, and then something unexpected happened because um, you know um, they have to they had to establish like a freedom camp for these bears because they didn't even know how to leave as free bears. So um, there was this transition, and 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 gradually they. In small doses, they, they, they were given a little bit of freedom uh, with some limits. And because they never experienced it, they, they didn't know what, what to do. So I really like this fragment that, that despite these excellent conditions, honey, strawberries, public campaigns, personal commitment of Brigitte Bardot, um, despite the support of other influential animal lovers, the food hidden under stones, 
the frequent visits by a German dentist, urine, correct number of calories, despite the fact the metal nose rings they used to have uh, were rusting and display. And despite all of this, to this day almost all the birds still dance. So when they see, uh, when they see a human being, they would dance as in all times. Uh, it's a very powerful story about people after communism. I, I would really encourage you to read this book. Um, another, uh, another example, the book came out in, uh, in English, I think last year, a few months ago, by one of my colleagues, uh, Philip Springer. He's best known in Poland for writing stories that if he would describe us the, the topic he's going to write about everybody is like oh that sounds boring but then he writes just great books out of it and he did that six times already so he's pretty powerful in that and his uh, first book published in, uh, in Poland seven years ago but it, 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 it came out uh, just a few months ago in English was about um, a story of a forgotten Polish and also German town called uh, Miedzianka Kupferberg uh, uh, so he wanted to uh, get to know how did it happen that a town that used to be uh, quite big just disappeared during years, and all, so so it's a metaphor for for other disappearing cities or regimes. But also he is paying uh, much attention to details because uh, so, so first of all he's starting with those very in detailed scenes, as you may see here on the screen. And then he, he writes about the bottle stopper he had. Then he writes um, uh, about, once again about the stopper. And then he would find a bottle as a narrator. So uh, the bottle and the stopper are those little details that are symbols of the city that no longer exists. And he plays with those uh, two. Uh, to gadgets uh, and you know thinking and wondering what what happened to Mijanka. So the stopper and the bottle, nothing more. They wouldn't have meant anything either. That sort of an of archaeology is pointless because when it's over, you still have to imagine anyway. As you sit on the bus from Yelena Gura, it's a little city in Poland, staring through the window and wondering, did Fransky walk past this bottle? Did he hold it? Who bought it? Who drank the beer? Um, Philip Springer, in this um, in this particular case, uh, he shows this like a quite popular technique that if you don't know a lot, you can always ask additional questions. Then you come up with some images in the reader's head, uh, and and you can create a story even though you you cannot state something for sure. Another young journalist. Um, uh, in, in, in her great uh, book about, um, there, there was a Jewish uh, educational activist, Janusz Korczak, he's, he's quite famous in Poland. Uh, but the woman who helped her helped him for, for years, and uh, that, that was just before the Second World War, uh, was, uh, was pretty much in hiding. So, so what uh, Magda Kicinska did was to uh, unravel the, the mystery behind this uh, woman, and she did use the the style, the details, and uh, all, all, all we all we specialize in. So that was about tigers and circus, but it was of course not about tigers and circus. It was about the reportage that's based on details, it's using metaphors and have specific structure, and we teach those skills in our Polish School of Reportage. It's only for Polish people, though we have some international students, but they speak Polish. Uh, so we have, a, we have a great, great school. I'm also alumni of that five years ago. I, I went there and we're learning how to look for details, look for metaphors, deal with a story, deal with people we interview. And um, it's, it's like a great, great adventure. And uh, for those nine years, we we already uh, managed to to teach like more than two hundred students, and among them, there's more than twenty people who already published their own non-fictional books. So there's a big boom for narrative stories in in Poland, and I really I'm really proud I'm part of it. Thank you for your time and.
I would encourage you to I would encourage you to join me for my second session uh, on my own book. Yeah, but, but, you, but you may just be standing here really? for some time still. Yeah, because oh. there's, there's someone who's just trying to come here, but so I have having, to. needing a lot of time to do so. She went just. She went through customs. We're following her every move. Um, Camille's going to get out of this second set. Can I ask you questions between? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you all set? Because yeah, I, I wonder one thing. This, the thing. This, the bus leaves every day. I was wondering, how did, did the censorship work? Because the, the censors, they must have realized that this piece was as critical as any piece would be, where it would actually, you know, were they lazy or were they deliberately letting these things through? As I said, it's uh, so not 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 all the all those people who work as, uh, as censors were uh, really into this ideology. Yeah. So there were a lot of smart people who 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 read a lot of books and they kind of wanted those journalists to to exactly. to work like that. So 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 that was the play. That was the the only thing was sometimes to convince the censor that that he or she wouldn't go into troubles by accepting this because it was metaphorical enough. But you know, communism was, as I, as I have heard, was like a big play. Do you uh, think there um, was a back and forth between the, could, 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 could they say, you know, if you get these words out, then maybe it'll pass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? That was, yeah, but, but, you, but sometimes they, they would cut out words without even telling you, yeah, so exactly. that's what editors sometimes do, even yeah. today. <laughs> Horrible people. <laughs> Horrible people. These yeah. editors. Listen, are there are there elements in in your own work where you deliberately try to not follow the rules of the school school of the Polish those, school of reportage? Those are not like given rules, so I, I wouldn't say it's like a set of rules that are changing. And uh, I was so so according to the the title of conference, I was really looking for my own voice and uh, all of that. So I sometimes I felt like. I know like a little trick. I, I read it somewhere in Kapuscinski's or Kraus or Stigel's book and I would use it. So I would say that the, the main rule is, is, is to use only those rules that apply to your certain yeah. story. And I think that writing every story is, is like starting from scratch all the time. So That's true. So I was wondering, you're head of curriculum, right? At the School of Polish Reputation? Yeah. Um, yeah. So are, there, those. are there not many young people who come there and they say, like, you have to learn about communism, and what does that have to do with today's world? <laughs> doesn't the school of reportage, doesn't it, what will happen to it once it will become a distant memory, or are we not there yet? No, we, uh, so, so, so the thing is that, that we don't really teach them those rules. So I think that a lot of young journalists don't really know about what I just said. It's like, for me, it was a big discovery. How did it happen that, that, that we have such interest in such stories. So that's only, uh, we, w w w what we teach those people is just practical writing and, and it's practical not a skills. Class on no, 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 it's all practical. So they, they would uh, pick a topic and, and the teachers would help them pick like a relevant topic, then how to write it, how to talk to interviewees, how to deal with difficult situations, how to, how to prepare yourself for traveling, how to edit. And everybody has like one personal tutor, one of, also those, uh, those more famous Polish writers, and they work together on one piece during one year to, have, to, to make it like perfectly, you know, the best possible. So that's the thing, no history. Okay. You just published your first book. Please yeah. show it to everyone, because you must be proud. It's now in Dutch, yeah. right? I'm proud, but I want to show both covers. Both so covers. one year ago, Polish one, and then Dutch one. Quite a difference, as I said yesterday. <laughs> It tells you something about like those two countries. I so it's like more, you know, sneaky crime story, <laughs> and then it's like all sperm. So, <laughs> ik, uh, thank you. I ga je het podium geven om verder te vertellen. Je spreekt Nederlands. Ik spreek Nederlands, maar ik ga in in het Engels. Ik ga het in het Engels doen. Plus. Okay. Alle kinderen van Louise. I'm I'm really interested to hear about this book. So you you have the floor for okay, some you. more minutes. Uh, sorry, but how, how many minutes? How many sorry. minutes? How many minutes? How many minutes? Anyone? Thirty and then Q and A, right? Oh. Yeah. Okay.
By the way, FY Hirsch, the one who we're waiting for, she will not like, be sent back to the airport straight away. There's actually a session where his name is now on. But she'll, be, she'll be here and you can see, listen to her story. That's the short version. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so uh, the main question was how, how, how did I um, come up with my own voice? So it all started in, um, in, in a cold autumn evening in 2005. I was 17 at that time. And I remember there, there was one book that uh, made me cry for the first time. And uh, that was uh, a book called Like Eating Stone by also Polish journalist Wojciech Tochman, who, uh, who was tracing an anthropologist um, trying to find uh, and recognize scattered human bones after the war in Bosnia. And Tochman's sentences were very short and very powerful, sharp as knives. Uh, so reading them, I realized that that verb is one of the most important uh, like functions in, uh, in storytelling because verb tells a story. Uh, what I didn't imagine at that time was that nine years later uh, this author Wojciech Tochman will become the publisher of my first non-fictional book because I didn't really think that I, 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 I would be a journalist. I was just a big fan of reportage at the moment. So and then how I started with uh, Dutch language and Dutch country. So there are two, yeah, two two stories I usually tell because I'm not quite sure if they were both at the same time true or or, or maybe like partly. It's it's hard to say. But first of all, was that uh, I was in my second year of uh, I was in my master's in journalism and I wanted to learn a new strange language, and <laughs> I already spoke English. And my girlfriend, she was studying French and Spanish, and then it was not very easy to start German without a German exam at the end of the high school, so I didn't have that one. And then I, I had this choice between Russian and Dutch, and the Dutch was in the city center. So, <laughs> but that's not all true because uh, I just, um, I, I also, uh, I really wanted to move to Belgium or the Netherlands for my master's, but then I started to learning it uh, in, um, in Poland and learning about the culture and, and I really wanted to finish those studies. So then I ended up having a bachelor in Dutch studies and I, at first I just wanted to, you know, just for one semester uh, try and what's going on. So then I went to Flanders and uh, in Flanders, after Flanders I had this, um, uh, yeah, I had this idea of following Flemish and Dutch news. And in Dutch, um, a magazine, Humo, there was in 2014, there was an article uh, about. Uh, is there? Yeah. There was this art article. Sorry. Which was very tabloid like. So the sperm and mafia leaking sperm tanks of Dr. Jan Kerbat. That was kind of weird to read. Uh, but I found it interesting. I was a little bit uh, uh, into this, uh, this this sensational story of, of, of a donor who has uh, supposedly has uh, 200 children. He was uh, half Dutch, half Surinamese. And uh, some of the, those families didn't really expect uh, babies to be uh, like they they were they were some of them were white some of them were a little darker but, but but some of those families didn't expect that so that was the first trace of that and then it turned out that that the donor passports that were used by uh, uh, Jan Karbat so the doctor the boss of uh, uh, the clinic in Barendrecht uh, near Rotterdam that those passports didn't really uh, like all, almost all of them were made up or, or, or did, didn't really make any sense. Um, then there was this interview with uh, the guy I, I, I later uh, called Louis, because I changed his name, so the half Surinamese donor. Uh, and, and he was um, saying some weird things that, that, that he, he feels he's very powerful and that having 200 children is like, you know, a bigger power than having two children. So I was really. I was I, I was really surprised reading that, um, and I decided to write an article about it. But um, 
I didn't know how to start <laughs> because um, there were some donor children who were already uh, in their 20s and 30s and they, some of them realized that, that uh, they are in the middle of this, this trouble. So some of them had um, uh, their fathers, like legal fathers. Some of those fathers left families. And, uh, and some of them, of those donor children, wanted to find out who uh, their real father is. Um, but I thought maybe they, they're not going to talk to me. And the second thing was that in this article, I, I, I didn't really find uh, surnames to to trace. So I, I was just l googling and, and and looking for some for some other traces. And then I uh, realized. Oh yeah, I I I, I want to say that that the uh, this article had been copied and then translated uh, by using just Google Translate and distributed all over the internet. Uh, and then it looks something like it was something like that that there's autistic Suriname sperm donor impregnated who impregnated up to 500 Dutch women there was this picture and I didn't really know what 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 happened because it didn't really make sense for me the boy looked too young and he was confused I guess um, so I really wanted to know what happened. I already n knew that this news is, is is sort of a fake news because I read the original article. So uh, this translation was bad. But the translation to English uh, spread across the internet, uh, and uh, yeah, generated some interest of, of far right movements, uh, not only in the Netherlands but in the whole world. So I really wanna, wanted to know who, who the guy is and who are those people. And then I came across the uh, Ein van Dag program in uh, uh, Dutch television. And there was an interview with, with, with the guy called Henrik who uh, realized that his donor father is not uh, the guy Dr. Karbat said uh, the donor would be. So, so he had like a document called Donor Passport with some features of this man, but he already met the guy, so the Louis, and like everything was wrong about it. So he, he's supposed to have two kids and he didn't have uh, any. Uh, he's supposed to have a university degree and he didn't have it. Uh, he's supposed to be very social and actually he was almost unable to uh, ma maintain social relations and he had big troubles in, uh, in those relationships. So there was this, um, this program and then I knew uh, how to contact Henrik. I just found him on Facebook. But then how you convince a person to, um, to meet you? Because I already knew that this story is going to be more powerful than I thought. I asked my editors and I was also, um, I took part in a competition called Kapustinsky Scholarship for Young Reporters. Uh, so you, you have to hand out like a free uh, pages of a uh, project and you can get a scholarship uh, for, uh, for your first journalistic book and and that was the time I I, I, I felt like okay maybe I can kind of work on that to, to make it a book so then I wrote those three pages that was on those three pages there was like there were only information I, I I knew if they they would ask me to write a fourth page I would I wouldn't be able to add anything because I was just that was based on the internet and then I, I went to finals of this competition. I was like, oh my God, what, what's going on? Um, I, I didn't plan that. So uh, then I realized that if, if there is sufficient uh, you know, topic behind it, then maybe it's worth considering to actually work on a book. And I uh, started to ask my, my colleagues, uh, what do they, how do they feel about it? And, and, and they convinced me that, that I should try. But then after actually uh, like agreeing innerly uh, that, that I'm going to work on a book. Uh, I, already, I was already scared because then if, if, if the, the only person I, I had, so Henrik would refuse to meet me, then I would be like in trouble. So, so I remember that I asked my older uh, colleague, how do, you, how do you do it? Because I was not really you know experienced journalist. How do you do it? How do you convince like a very important person that, that he or she 
has to meet you in a way. And um, he told me, uh, you know, you have to be just very convincing. You have to just, you know, look inside your your brain, your will, and then kind of think like what the story means to you, and then like and be like this ocean. You just have to, you you, you just have to cover this guy with water, like your inner ocean. And I, and I was like, oh, okay. So. Uh, <laughs> So that's what I did. I, I wrote like a very, very long message to, to Henrik uh, trying to... Uh, it was not necessary, but I was just, you know, unexperienced. I think he would agree to meet me anyway. But, uh, um, but then uh, I was waiting for his reply for like two days and his reply was, oh my God, I've never received such a long message on Facebook. So, <laughs> and I never returned to this message because, you know, I was young and unexperienced. Um, there were some um, mm, already uh, some people who wanted to sue Carbat, and I know that I really want to meet Carbat because um, mm, he would be also one of the main um, persons and uh, people in the story. Uh, but I, I felt that I should just just keep it uh, for later and. Um, and then I, I started to uh, read about the, the whole world of sperm donation in the Netherlands. Uh, I worked like more than two and a half years and, um, and I became sort of an expert on Dutch sperm banks, which was funny because I didn't really know anything about it in Poland before. And, uh, uh, and now I, I, I know more about Dutch situation than Polish one. So, so uh, also, also the Dutch situation is is a bit easier to investigate because it's all in hiding and and, and anonymous in in Poland or in Belgium. Um, and I plan to visit Dr. Kerbat in his great villa, which used to be a sperm bank. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So when I saw this building, I was like, oh yeah, I'm writing, I'm writing the story. Uh, so all my all my interviewees, so those uh, adults who were donor children, were actually conceived in this villa. So uh, I found it very powerful. Um, there's a child on the right. Watch out! <laughs> I found some uh, even some pictures of uh, old tanks with sperm. I mean, there were straws, of course, inside, but. Okay, but then I realized that the stories uh, merge together, kind of, because I realized that the story of Henrik is actually uh, a story that, that is linked to the Humo story, because uh, uh, Amanda, who, who, who was uh, featured in Humo story, um, she was, she, she, like, her mother was, was, was angry that the donor was darker. She didn't really know what, what, what are her genetical origins and then same story had was was a story of, of Henrik so so I realized that they actually after interviewing Henrik that they are actually um, half brothers and sister and um, it all started in 2010 because of um, television program and as as you as you know, uh, as Polish people didn't didn't really know about it. Uh, Dutch television programs are pretty strong. So, so the Netherlands is is like this lead uh, country when it comes to TV formats. And as I said yesterday, it's even funny because even the format uh, "I Love Poland" originated in uh, the Netherlands. So Polish people watch it. Some of them without knowing that that uh, public television pays uh, Dutch. Uh, format. So, uh, and then there's a lot of such formats in the Netherlands. Some of them were really unexpected for me. And there was one in 2010 uh, called V is Main Father. So, who is my father? Uh, they wanted to uh, uh, find donor children and fi find donor fathers who who wanted to be to go in public because it, it was because it was not compulsory before, but, but after a while some people were were ready for that, and to make them meet on uh, on television, uh, and they did that. But it was just one. There was a, just one episode, 
because um, as far as I learned, uh, it was it was quite hard at that time to convince people uh, to, to 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 show up on the television and to to create like a weekly show out of it. So there was just one uh, episode. But what what was very um, powerful to me was that this one episode. Uh, so so the the Louis the super super donor let's call call him uh, he um, he didn't see the first episode he didn't see the one that was repeated after that and after a few weeks he recorded uh, a tape of his favorite movie and then the the recorder was still recording after that so he watched the movie and then he went to the kitchen to uh, yeah, make a sandwich or something like that. And then he, he heard the names from this show like the, that, that started just after that. It, that was this one and only episode of V's Main Father. And he, and he heard those, those names and then he realized that 20 years before he was in Barendrecht in this uh, fertility clinic. And uh, he sneaky, sne sneakingly uh, went to the room uh, with documentation, everything was anonymous, but he knew that he's one of the few donors with brown eyes and certain uh, blood group. And he browsed through it, he saw that there is one anonymous donor with such qualities, and then he saw that, that, that there are already some births uh, like on his account, let's say. Uh, and there were those twins, Mike and Matthias. So after 20 Years he realized he 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 has heard those uh, those names and that's how he realized that there are actually uh, people out there who who are uh, maybe ready to meet him. So that's that's how it all started and the first group of six children and the donor met each other in 2000 and I guess 11 in uh, Fium. So the um, the organization which which. Uh, works in uh, in that field. Uh, here is Mike and Bjorn, who later be become a, uh, became a, um, also a part of a television program Sporlos. He went to television to, to find uh, as many uh, br half-brothers and half-sisters as possible. Uh, so then I learned that it's going to be also a story about television and about how television shapes human beings and how television could actually change your life and decision you made. Uh, which is, like, from Polish perspective, it was very interesting because uh, Polish audience is still not that open to, the, to, to, to such conclusions. And um, so the, the other thing was that, oh yeah, here. Here's a fragment of Sporos when Bjorn is looking for uh, brothers and sisters. And I was really lucky because when I started there were like 10 or 12 uh, half brothers and half sisters who found each other. And during almost three years of my work, uh, the group uh, grown, ha ha had grown to uh, more than 50 people. So I was really lucky to kind of document the, the growth of this group. So how is it actually to, to meet people who have the same biological father as you? Uh, are they similar? It turned out that that majority of them, for example, like sushi. Uh, and they were really, really looking for those similarities. They were, there's a lot of uh, teachers in this group, for example, a lot of biologists and biotechnologists. So, so, so the discussion, like what's nature, what's nurture, was, was, was just great in this case. And then um, the second thing uh, was that uh, that's the map when they were like a group of 14 people. That's the map where, where did they live in uh, the Netherlands because they were all, all from all around. And, um, but um, what was also interested, interesting for me was that the donor uh, had uh, light Asperger syndrome. And that was the reason why he actually had so many children because he started in the 80s he he really fixed himself like he had this like fixation on 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 so many children because he he just didn't want to uh die without having children and he had serious problems with relationships and because people with asperger likes uh um 
the, like likes to repeat activities. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds funny, but it's uh, actually very powerful and uh, sad sto story. So I encourage you to read it. Uh, like all such talks ha have those drawbacks that it, it sounds suddenly funny, but it was actually not that funny. But because of Asperger, he he went to this clinic for uh, almost 20 years, three times a week. And that, those were the results. But there was the, this other side of the story, uh, Dr. Corbett, who let him do it. And now we know after he died that, uh, that he also used his own semen in, uh, in the clinic. So, um, okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just show you a quick video. Uh, those are uh, the halfiest. Behalve Ariane, Simone, Jordi, That's a fragment from Sparlows. I don't own. I don't. I don't own copyrights. I'm sorry. Oh, for us or in total? For us. So those are those people who have the same uh, donor father. Twelve. That's echt... Wow. That's not best feel. <laughs> Yeah, but they, so after that they were 20, now they are 50, so you can imagine that the group is, is constantly growing and um, yeah, but what was very important for my voice was, was also working on a background, because uh, first of all, I really wanted to work on this uh, Asperger background, and I wrote the whole story, uh, the whole chapter, uh, trying to describe people how how do people with Asperger perceive world? So uh, trying to um, kind of train myself to meet uh, Louis after a while. After I, I would try to totally understand the, the vision of a person with 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 Asperger because it's a little bit different, and I really wanted to uh, pe readers to to feel it as well. And then uh, I realized that Dr. Corbett actually when 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 he was younger, I was I was really uh, surprised that. Mm, there were some news in Dutch television and articles about Dr. Corbett and about that he started in the 90s his own clinic. And the clinic, you know, went crazy. Uh, but nobody actually uh, was interested in what did he do before. Because he started this clinic when he was already in his 60s. So, like, the whole career was... was uh, uh, you know, before, and then I um, realized when when he didn't uh, let me into his uh, house, I had like the whole um, because I asked like I asked like three times, and I had the whole day uh, f like free because I didn't manage to get interview. So I went to uh, libraries, and I, then I discovered this great website, Delphi. I'm sure a lot of you knows about it. Uh, we don't really have such such a good website in, 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 in Poland. And then I digged into the, uh, you know, years of uh, of Dutch newspapers with the surname Karbat in articles. So then I learned about what he did. And, and what I also learned was that he, after his studies, as young doctor, he moved to Suriname. And he was living in Suriname at the same time when uh, Louis was born there. Uh, so that gave me another uh, additional uh, storytelling advantages. And I went through all the history of Dutch sperm donation, even 60s. I was really amazed that Dutch people were so conservative in 50s and 60s. I didn't know that. <laughs> And then I had additional um, ad additional uh, chapter with uh, uh, with a woman who uh, believed that uh, Dr. Corbett himself is uh, is uh, her uh, donor father. So so I also we visited Dr. Corbett together, and uh, that, that's how I uh, turned my story into something else. Like the, Dr. Corbett was was like additional. Uh, person, like character in my story. And I finally managed to meet him and ask him all the questions I wanted to ask him. So uh, the, the last thing I want to I wanna say be, before Q&A is that um, I didn't know how to write this book uh, because I've never did that before. So then I realized that this, it's like a big story and I, I have to tell it as movie. So I have to uh, give everyone some scenes and, of course, cliffhangers. And I was lucky because there were so many cliffhangers in that. So, uh, so even when I 
had problems finding some some solutions to to, to, to how to go further. I've learned from my older colleagues that you can always turn it into advantage. So for example, Karbat didn't want to meet me, so then I wrote a letter to him, and then I include this letter into the book. Uh, and I had like, like a whole narrative in the direction I, w I wanted it to have. Uh, or I was late for the, for, pla for the plane, and I didn't manage to meet Louis. And it was very bad because he, ha he had this Asperger, so he didn't, didn't like changes. So, so I almost lost uh, the chance. But then I describe it uh, in the book. So, uh, so I, was, I was always looking for those cliffhangers. And, yeah. I would. So maybe, yeah. Uh, I don't have a yes, like ending word, so maybe. I'm coming threateningly yeah. close, I know. Thank you so much for improvising for us because... FYI yeah, sorry, it's supposed to be like one hour later, but I anyway, I, I like it all. I want um, warm applause for Samuel Bauch. <laughs>